Being the best often means being the fastest, which frequently looks like this. Or sometimes this. Or even this. So when a new secret project aimed at entering new territory is on the drawing board, bows up in the air and dead straight wakes are often what's in mind. But that wasn't the case for the new magic carpet. Big breezes and full-on foam-ups were not part of the brief. Yet Magic Carpet's goals were no less ambitious. In fact, according to those who built her, the fourth and latest Magic Carpet is the most revolutionary vessel to enter the maxi scene in over a decade. And that's just the kind of chatter we like. And it's why we've come to the south coast of France to be the first to get aboard to find out what it's all about. It's not often that you get an invitation to get aboard a modern maxi, let alone one of the latest 100 foot super maxis. But that's what we got, and with it came an invitation to spend 48 hours aboard one of the latest boats in this class, Magic Carpet E. We were also fortunate enough to have some of the world's leading experts who are the brains behind this new boat talk us through it. Welcome to the modern maxi. On the face of it, the original goals were clear. Owner Sir Lindsay Owen Jones fancied a new boat. As a fanatically keen Maxi owner driver, he's had three previous Maxis. All of them have been called Magic Carpet, and all of them have enjoyed success on the race course. But it's never been just about the racing. Sir Lindsay has always insisted on at least one annual summer cruise in comfort. So when it came to sketching out the next boat, Satisfying both briefs provided its own set of challenges for the designers and project managers. But this time the goal was slightly different. They wanted to be the fastest maxi yacht in the world, but in 10 to 12 knots of wind. So why set the wind bar so low? The answer is simple. The new Magic Carpet was designed to sail primarily where all her predecessors had been, here in the Mediterranean where, as we know, it's usually light winds or blowing dogs off chains. So the logic was pretty clear, except that's not quite how this project started. The idea that I would only do it if I thought I'd found a way to do something really different. Otherwise, it wasn't worth it. When we went from two, we went from the whole generation of slim, very elegant Hermann Frères boats like stealth and same sort of boat and two suddenly a broad uh, stem boat and, and a totally different look and but as soon as I had it I was already thinking I wonder what the next big step is going to be uh, we kept on improving it and we were always wondering yeah but what would you do to do something really better and I couldn't see anything and years go by you can see what you could do slightly better, but not much better. And then one day, somebody introduced me to Guillaume Verdier, and Guillaume, having thought about the program, said, I'd like to try. Nobody's done it, but I think I could do a boat like yours 10 tons lighter, and it will go like a rocket. I said, well, it's worth spending something to find out. And so we started talking and we started uh, reacting. That, and it was because he had faith that you could do something radically different and not just a small increase. And radical she certainly is. 
At 37 tonnes, she's 10 tonnes lighter than the previous Magic Carpet. She has a canting keel with a 9.5 tonne bulb that also acts like a centreboard. She has a retractable canard that can change its angle of attack and also cants. And on top, there's a 46 metre carbon mast with a sail plan that looks like a scaled up in mocha. And yet, there are just six winches on deck. But the biggest difference between this boat and the rest of the Maxi fleet is that Magic Carpet E is fully electric, an idea that had first cropped up years before. And I'd spoken to someone on the phone who'd just seen this amazing electric motor, which was tiny, and we were chatting in the car and I was going, it'd be great if you could do that with the hydraulics. And Ed's fantastic petrol head was like, yeah, but at the moment the battery technology's there, the, you know, the power will always be, the, you know, the power you get from the diesel engine or uh, combustion engine is always better compared to its weight. But to his credit, he obviously st stayed in his head and monitored all the, monitored the progress and we kept the subject alive. He did a lot of work um, looking at energy usage on the boat from all the data we had. And we got to a, we got to a point on our own where we thought it was feasible. And um, so Lindsay, you know, is always into the technology thing. And we were, we were sort of talking about it quite a bit. And then he pushed us to go further. Um, and we went to what it was Williams Advanced Engineering. William um, is now Fortescue. And they were very keen to get involved. Uh, they were very interested in it. And they um, really helped us analyze what we needed in terms of power, energy use, and duration. So, and, and what weight, how much, what it would cost us in weight. Uh, traditionally, you have a big, large diesel engine which produces the hydraulic power needed, needed to, to get the performance and the speed you need to go around an inshore racetrack. So that was always there, but the problem was what we felt was, and so Lindsay was a big driver for Sir Lindsay, it was just taking away the romance. You know, if we could get rid of this big diesel engine in the background, even, even, even when it's just ticking over, it's a presence that if you're a, a sailor, is not really a welcome presence. And I, I was sort of nostalgic about old boats where you just sailed, right? So when we started the, the hybrid uh, electric project for this, this project, we, we looked at what we would do both in a thermic option and an electric option. And the thermic option would have meant us having a, a huge V12 diesel engine to get the power needed. So we then looked at the electric option, uh, which was the big driver, one of the big drivers for, for, for building this boat. And because of my motor racing background, I knew quite a lot about hybrids and what you could do. And I was following Formula E quite closely. And I was thinking, I'm sure one of these days we're going to find that you can supply power from electricity without it being a hugely overweight solution that you would reject for racing reasons and so we started making calculations and the first ones came back negative it can't we do it's too heavy then we kept doing more and we started getting a better grip on how many kilowatts or whatever it was we needed for a day's racing and how big a battery and how heavy that would be in the very early days we had so much data from mc3 so we took all of that data from our logging system and years of reports, of post-regatta reports. We then went uh, to Caraboni and we sat down and we discussed the numbers. So we knew we were going to have a Canton Keel, we knew we were going to have a Canard. We got those numbers and we basically pushed, put them together. We then uh, worked out how many tacks we did in an average race. We looked at how many jives we did, how many sets we did. We then also looked at the average duration of racing. That, we, that takes part in our season. So we took an extreme case, which was four hours, 27 minutes, and we took a lower case, which was like an hour and 20 minutes, it's like a windward lured day. And we combined all of those, and we looked at all the different maneuvers, all the different tacks and jibes and everything, and we did power cycles. We created 15 scenarios. But we still weren't sure. But it looked then suddenly credible enough to go and find some expert advice. 
And so we went to Williams, Williams Racing, because I knew them from long distance racing and from Formula E. And uh, they were fantastic. They, they said, yes, OK, if you give us an accurate description of how much power you need, we can work out the exact weight of all the system that you would need to have and how it would affect all the systems, not just the powertrain, but the winches and everything else. And when they came back, the amazing thing was that it was OK. <laughs> and so what had been a bit of a, a dream, because it was more about silent sailing, I have to admit, than really about green sailing, but there was a green element too. Uh, and suddenly it looked possible. And that was another trigger, exactly as you said, to say, hey, it is time to do a new one. Mm. With, you know, I remember the first day sailing we did in November when we, we did the soft launch and the technical sea trials. Everyone was looking at the battery power, how much <laughs> we produced and how much we used. And then slowly after the first three, four, five, six times sailing, everyone was like, wow, it's right. And we, all the data that was fed back from those early sessions to Williams Advanced Engineering, we, we were right. That all the numbers ticked the boxes and, and, and it went really well. So, yeah, we're, 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 it was tough, but it's been a, a huge relief is not the right word. I think sense of being right, you know, mm. it's, uh, it's, we, we got our numbers correct. I think you're right first time, relief. Yeah. <laughs> But it wasn't just about the racing. The cruising brief was very challenging too. We have, a, uh, we have basically a, a sort of segmented season uh, and, it, and it's just the way it, it's worked for a long time and it works because there's, you know, there is a series of spring regattas you can do. They've changed a little bit through the, through the years where we go, Portofino or Palma or Barcelona, we used to go to for a while. We've done uh, Mahon, um, uh, with Sorrento now, and obviously here for the Giralia, uh, the Giralia inshore and offshore. And then after that, we put the boat into more of a family friendly mode and we go day sailing from Saint Tropez here and we go out for day sail, picnic, lunch, swimming, come back in and sail. And then we go cruising late, late July, early August for a while somewhere we've done our oh, previous boats we've down to you know croatia greece um mediterranean based stuff but uh all with family and friends on board and a very limited crew you know we're, th we're three four people as crew on board and i we've tried to keep that uh keep that in this boat you know keep that mentality in this boat so that, uh, that's it's going to be the plan that's what we want to do and you're still, you, you sail the boat, you don't just motor when you no, go to no, cruising. So, I can assure you we sail every day. We sail to lunch and back from lunch. I've always maintained that if you were really clever in designing the interior, you could make it, I'd say, rating neutral. Just a little bit heavier, but not much. And what you lose on that weight, you gain on the rating. And I've even seen people more knowledge than me now claiming that a racing boat should have an interior for that reason. But whatever, it makes it possible. And it also makes sense economically because my boats have all found, when I would finished racing them, happy owners who use them as everyday sailing and cruising boats. And they're still around and they're still happy with them. <laughs> and so they've had second and third life because if you have a a beautiful boat that people say, wow, this is pretty, this is nice. There's always somebody who wants to take it on and sail it on uh, when you can move to your next racing boat. What an interior. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, but it's huge, but it almost looks too good to take racing. Yeah, obviously, uh, obviously, Matt, this is uh, the heart of Magic Carpet. You know, we, we spend a lot of time in here. You know, it's a, it's, it's a family space for Sir Lindsay and his family. And it's also a place where we sit and debrief after a full day's racing. So it's, a, it's what I would say, one of the, where the business happens in, on Magic Carpet. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important, a really important space to Sir Lindsay. And what we try to do is carry that, that um, luxury feel that we've got in, in the master cabin and carry it through into this. You know, it's the first thing you see when you enter the boat. We'll be taking a closer look at the interior and the systems that lie within in parts two and three. 
We'll also be looking at how she sails and what this lightweight flyer feels like on the helm. But in the meantime, here's a quick taster. So here are the basic numbers. We are sailing at 103 degrees true at the moment. We got 11.9, so 12 knots of true wind, and we're doing 16, sometimes just up to just under 17 knots. It's unbelievable. 